Well, good morning. We will eventually get to Ephesians, but I invite you to turn to the book of Romans as we kind of launch off this morning into kind of a new perspective, not the new perspective of Paul, but a new perspective that Paul is going to address us with this morning. Ultimately, the front-line battle of the Reformation was the issue of justification. Rather simplistically, the Roman Catholic Church believed, and still does today, that one was and is justified or finds his or her righteousness meritoriously in his or her works. Luther and the boys fought and died standing on the biblical teaching that one is justified completely apart from works, completely justified by faith alone. Several hundred years later, the evangelical church is and has been making another push to make sure this ever-important doctrine is kept clear and firm in the church today. The reformers of yesterday and the orthodox evangelical church today know and believe that this is the one doctrine that the church stands or falls on. A church that mixes the merit of works with the merit of Jesus in justification not only has approached the slippery slope of error, but has completely slid down the mountain of false teaching and a false doctrine that is to be completely rejected by all. The doctrine of justification and in what is referred to as positional sanctification are wonderful truths that should cause great joy. Great joy and assurance and peace and thanksgiving and worship in the hearts and minds and lives of every true believer. And these truths are very, the very foundation of all we have and do as believers. Justification, as far as Paul is concerned in his letters to the churches, he, he taught and wrote, and this is where he always began. And to some extent, you can get election wrong and still be saved. To some extent, you can get sanctification wrong. And to some extent, you can uh, get glorification wrong and still be saved. But if we get justification wrong, we get the gospel wrong. If we get justification wrong, we get everything wrong. And Paul's teaching on justification was so clear and so separate from works, he was accused of being antinomian. Antinomianism, if you're familiar with it, it's the belief that all you have to do is, is just simply believe something about Jesus. It, it claims that faith has no fruit and that one's life after conversion does not need to change. Antinomianism claims you can live any way you want and go to heaven just as long as you believe something about Jesus. And this is really where we find ourselves in the book of Romans in chapter 6. See, in chapters 1 through the middle of chapter 3, Paul's laying out the truth and the reality of the depravity of man. None is righteous in chapter 3, right? No, not one. And because of this, we are all at enmity with God. But look what he says, or look what he lays out in chapter 3, verses 22 to 24. He says, The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. He then proceeds to teach about this justification that is by faith alone through grace. This righteousness that is imputed to the believer based upon God's gift of faith and only faith. Nowhere in this discussion of Paul's up to this point, nowhere does Paul directly or indirectly infer that there are things that you must do to accomplish in order to be saved. It's based solely upon the work of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. There's nothing you can or have done to be right before the Lord. Nothing. In Romans 5, verse 12, he begins to lay out how our union with Adam brought sin and death 
But the believer's union with Christ brings justification, a right standing before God the Father. Again, no works, only being found in Christ, union with Christ, only this imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. And again, all of this, Paul says, is from God's gracious love and favor. And so, the question or the argument that Paul now anticipates in Romans and probably had from many people was went something like this. If we are saved by grace through faith alone, if our righteousness is foreign and given to us freely, if we contribute nothing to our salvation, if we don't have to do a thing, then we're free to live any way we want. The more we sin, the more grace is given to us. The more we sin, the more kindness we receive from the Lord. And Paul anticipates that. And so now he writes chapter 6. Look at Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. In anticipation of this accusation of being antinomian, Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Heavens no, Paul says. Absolutely not. He says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, to some extent, really to a growing extent, this is one of the issues facing the evangelical church today. See, the fear of being legalistic and pharisaical is causing a growing number of church leaders to believe and ask the questions that cause Paul to write chapter 6 in Romans. They believe that obedience is optional for the believer. If one is saved by faith alone, then you only have to obey if you want to. If you feel like it. Because if you don't feel like it, then you're adding works to your salvation. You're going back to the law and avoiding grace, so they claim. And we absolutely should. Brothers and sisters, we should be fearful of legalism and preaching a works-based salvation. A works-based justification and, and sanctification are different, and we have to know that. But we have to make sure that we don't swing the pendulum too far to the other side of the balance point. And really, the issue is that we have to make sure we keep justification and sanctification separate, but we have to make sure that they are still both understood and applied in how they work together. We have to be crystal clear. Our redemption is accomplished by the grace of God alone. We were dead, Paul told us, has told us. And he made us alive, granted us repentance, and he is the one who has transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. We have done nothing. So then what now is the relationship between the indicatives in the imperatives. What is the relationship between what Christ has already done for us and then how are we to respond to those? Because we are. We are still called. We are still commanded to obey the Lord. And not only that, the Lord commissions us not only to obey, but to teach others to obey as well. So then, if we are justified apart from works, what role do our works play in our whole salvation. What difference does it make if I obey or not? One great answer is given to us by a couple men who co-authored a book, Jerry Rag and Paul Shirley. They team wrote a book titled Free to be Holy. And the context of this book is this very issue. Our justification does not free us to sin, but it frees us to live a life pleasing and glorifying to Christ. And in our works, our obedience in no way adds to the work of Christ, but they manifest the power of Christ's work. 
Our obedience proves the power of the gospel and the work of Christ. They write this. But if we truly believe the gospel, our submission to Christ will not be for the purpose of adding anything to the cross, but rather magnifying His glory through the display of His power. To live out the gospel is to cherish and appropriate the power of the gospel so that Christ is fully formed in us. What a great quote. And isn't that exactly what we've been learning in our study in Ephesians? That up to this point, Paul has been doing nothing but laying out for us who Christ is and what he's accomplished for us and what being in him has done to us. This is the very foundation of who we are and this is the very foundation of our lives as Christians. And now in our letter, Paul is nearing the point. He's there. And he's going to teach us what Christ and his work applied to us is to look like. Not to earn more of him, but to make him known. We have a friend in Hutchinson. Works for a company who... Uh, they have several crews, but they go around the Midwest, and what they do is these, these big grain uh, elevator, these big, huge concrete uh, grain storage facilities. They go in prior to the, the, the storage unit being built, and they're the ones who drill and dig the huge holes that are filled with concrete that are the base, the foundation that anchor these huge storage facilities in place. Foundation so deep and necessary that the building of the storage unit would never be able to accomplish what it is designed to accomplish without them. Without this foundation, these concrete storage units, when a storm came through, would topple over and fall. But you only know that they're there because the unit doesn't crumble when the wind comes. You only know that the foundation is there because of the fruit that it produces. And this is what Paul is now saying to us in Ephesians. The foundation of your justification has been laid. It's complete. It's finished. There is nothing that can be done to make you more justified. And you rest in the finished work of Christ for your salvation. There's nothing you can do or add to make yourself more right with God, but the life you live manifests. It, it proves it. It puts the work of Christ on display as you live a transformed life. In a world filled with men and women pursuing headlong after their sinful desires, the fruit of the gospel is produced in men and women in a scene as they pursue the things of Christ. Now as you're flipping back to Ephesians chapter 4. If you just glance at Ephesians 4 verse 17. really kind of takes us back to the beginning of this thought of Paul's. Paul describes to us this walk that is already ours, believer. The Christian's walk is not like that of the unbelievers. He tells us that that the old self has been put off and the new self is already put on. Again, as we saw last week, this is a, a past point in time reality that Paul has reminded us of. And really in these verses, Paul is explaining to us what separates the sheep from the goats and the wheat from the tares. And it really comes down to truth, right? Truth and how one responds to truth is what determines what group someone is put in. So again, in Ephesians 4, 17, we, we see the characteristics or the mind, how the unbeliever responds to truth. In verse 17, he describes their minds as futile. In verse 18, they have dark understanding, ignorance. Verse 22, they pursue the desires of deceit. Again, Paul described this person as the one who is able to look out in creation and recognize a creator and reject him. Reject him. 
It's the person who can look at the Word of God and see what Christ clearly says and says, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do it my way. This has been contrasted with the believer. In verse 20, Paul says that the believer has learned Christ. In verse 21, he's heard about Him. He's been taught truth. He's responded to truth. Christ is truth. In 23, their minds are being renewed. In verse 24, this new man is created in righteousness and holiness, which both of these find their source in truth. And so again, we've seen this emphasis of Paul's on truth over the last couple of weeks. Truth of the gospel. Truth of who Jesus is and what he's done. And, our, and the truth of our union with him. But all of these truths have to be more than just ascribed to facts. They have to be and create deep convictions in our lives. And this is how then we grow and mature in Christ. Again, I ask Rag and Shirley to help us understand this a bit. In this book, they say, deep conviction about the truth is what fuels spiritual growth, not emotionally charged experiences. That book doesn't sell today. In fact, the more we learn from Scripture about our redemption and trust our lives to the truth and yield our will to Christ in the power of the Spirit, the more our convictions deepen. Love and gratitude toward God are always proven through humble faith and conformity to His will. So again, we are saved. We are justified by faith alone, but as that faith grows in truth, our convictions deepen, and what we believe and know becomes evident in how we live. And so if we know and believe that we've been unified with Christ, and the old self is done away with, and the new one has come, as we were told in verses 20 to 24, our lives, Paul says, will manifest this truth more and more as we become more and more convinced of these truths and their implications in our lives. And this is why Paul can now, and, and only now, lay out for us the commands to obey. Because he's made it clear that our obedience in no way merits what Christ has already done and accomplished on our behalf. And he desires that these truths become deep-rooted convictions in our lives. We cannot be confused on these things. And once and only once that this is made clear, does Paul go on to say, therefore. Therefore, these imperatives are such that they will necessarily produce fruit. And because of what Christ has done and who we now are in Him, we are to look like the fruit that He died to produce. And in that, He gets the glory and the honor and the praise. Again, we are not free to sin. But we are now free to obey. So please stand with me one more time this morning as we read our passage together. Next three weeks we will be in verses 25 to 32 of chapter 4. Let's read these verses together. Paul says again, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Let's pray. Father, again, we are needy.
this morning we need you to open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to the truth of your word. Lord, as we come to this section in Paul's letter, there will be some of us who need encouragement. There will be some of us who need correction. There will be some of us who need convicted of sin. So Lord, we pray that your spirit will do that through the truth of your word. But in all things, may they point us back to the glorious work of Christ. To his sacrifice and to his work on our behalf. Lord, we pray to that in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So really what we're going to see in this section of Scripture, we're going to see five different sets of commands or exhortations that will help us live according to the new self, which manifests the work of Christ in the power of the Gospel. I didn't think as I sat down this week, I thought maybe I would try to take it in one lump sum, but I don't think that's going to be possible and do it justice. So we're going to break this up into three different parts. This week in part one, we're going to do the first two sets, or the first two exhortations. In a couple weeks, we'll do the third and fourth, and then the, the, the final one in three weeks. But as you'll see, as we sit down and we look at these exhortations, we'll see that each each one of these contain two commands. There'll be a negative command to put off or a positive command to put on. And along with these commands, each exhortation will contain a reason for the command. So beginning this new section, in verse 25, we see the word that's translated, therefore. Again, Paul is now pointing us to the application of of the believer's position in Christ. <clears throat> so since in Christ you have put off the old man and put on the new, this now, Paul is saying, this is what your life should be looking more and more like. The walk in the life of a person reflects the position of a person. And so Paul begins this series of exhortations or commands where we would expect him to begin. He spent the last several verses dealing with truth, and so this is where he starts up. See, the truth you believe is reflected in the truth you speak. Matt record, Matthew records the words of Jesus in chapter 12, verse 34 of his gospel. Jesus says, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And so he says the life of a Christian is one that is putting off lying and putting on telling the truth in verse 25. We see the negative command there, which technically happens when the positive is obeyed, and that is to put off or putting off falsehood. As we've discussed several times before, we live in a culture that no longer understands lying to be wrong. There's nothing wrong, it seems, with falsehood. No one really knows what to believe anymore. Scripture has much to say in regards to lying. John records a heated interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees in John chapter 8. In verse 40, 44, he says this to the religious leaders. He says, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So you learn here that Satan's very nature is bent towards falsehood. Lying is what he does. Lying is who he is. And he is the father of those who make lying a practice in their lives. 1 John 2, 21. John writes, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. It may seem obvious, or at least it should seem obvious, that lies and truth are antithetical. They are opposites. 
Truth, in order to be truth, cannot be mixed or tainted with any falsehood or any deception. In Revelation, we're told that no one who practices lying will enter into the coming age. Paul tells us in his second letter to the Thessalonian church, he describes the coming lawlessness, the lawless one, as one who deceives by false wonders. And in Romans, those who are under God's wrath have exchanged truth for a lie. The New Testament is very clear that lying is not okay. The idea of the New Testament word that Paul uses here communicates something that is not genuine or not real. So again, back in John 8, when Jesus was discussing his deity with the religious leaders, they kept asking him if he was greater than Abraham. And Jesus kept going back to the truth of who his father was and is. And this went back and forth for some, for some time. The point is, is that the lie that the religious leaders were teaching and the lie that they were believing was communicating something that was not real or genuine. They were communicating that Jesus was not God, but Jesus was God. And Jesus was before Abraham. And Jesus had seen the Father and was sent by the Father. And what was real and genuine was rejected by these religious leaders for something that was false and fake. And that is why, brothers and sisters, we must be putting off falsehood. Because when we lie, we are acting like our old self and not the new. We are not being who we genuinely are in Christ. We are not acting like Christ, who is truth. But we are acting like Satan, the father of lies. Notice how Paul puts it to the readers in Colossae. Colossians 3.9, he says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, which is with its practices. See, if the truth is in Jesus then lying can have no part with those who are in Him. Lying comes naturally to those who are still in the flesh. Lying is not just second nature to the unbeliever, it's his or her first nature. Again, it is antithetical to truth. Therefore, one who practices lying is antithetical to Jesus and the Christian. Now Paul gives us the main command of this exhortation, which is in the positive, and that is to speak truth. Paul says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Now Paul pulls this verse from Zechariah 8, verse 16. And in the context of Zechariah, God is proclaiming good to the remnant of Judah who are returning to Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile. And this group of men and women, they, they were tasked with the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the, and the walls of the temple. And this was going to take some hard work, some really hard work. Prior to these, or this Babylonian exile, one of the sins that God was continually calling this nation to repent of was the way they treated and spoke to each other. See, in Israel, before the, the exile, it had become a culture of lies and cheating. Every man and woman for himself or herself. The people of Israel had lost the value of truth. They had set aside honesty and were, were lying and cheating each other for personal gain. They had lost their identity and unity. And so naturally, one of, one of God's first instructions to this group of men and women who came back to Jerusalem to rebuild this nation was that they were to speak truth to one another. Truth was to be one of the foundational, relational aspects of this rebuilding of this nation. Speaking truth to one another was essential to the unity that was going to be completely necessary in order to complete this huge task of rebuilding the city and temple. See, the encouragement of truth was going to be utterly necessary for these men and women to survive. But not only to survive, but to complete what God had given them to do. 
So Paul uses this verse. He uses the same idea in Ephesians. He picks up on the same thought as he teaches on the unity and task of the church and the individual lives in the church. And just as the returning remnant of Israel was to speak truth, we are to call to this same truth speaking to be unified as well. And it is in this unity that the body is built up in love. It is in this unity that the body matures. And it's in this unity that we manifest the triune God. But it is also in this unity that we're equipped to carry out, fulfill the task of glorifying Christ. We will not, we cannot be unified if we aren't speaking the truth to each other. Our very righteousness and holiness, as we found out last week, finds its source in truth. The truth and the Christian go hand in hand. Truth is desired in the Christian and is becoming more and more natural to the person united with Christ. This is the reason why Paul gives this command. Look at the last part of verse 25. He says, For, for we are members of one another. Again, think with Paul for a second here. Imagine the human body as Paul wants us to. Imagine the eyes lying to the feet as the whole body tries to move around. What if the eyes see a, a stairwell coming up? And the eyes tell the feet that all is good, all is sound, and your next step will be solid ground, but once the foot tries to land, it finds nothing. The whole body stumbles and falls, bones are broken, skin is bruised, noses are bloody. The eyes... Not speaking truth to the feet causes the whole body to hurt and to suffer. Imagine the nose. As the mouth wants to take a cold drink of milk, but the nose doesn't speak the truth to the mouth that the milk is sour. The whole body suffers. We are to be members of one another, which communicates relationship. Truth and love always wants what is best for the other, and what is best for the parts is for the whole to be healthy and growing. And in this relationship, there is a dying to self, there is a trusting, there is an accountability to one another. And we don't like to hear these things much today. We love our individualistic do-it-yourself mentality that doesn't belong in the church. I need you. And you need me. And this happens in the sphere of truth and honesty. And if the truth is in Jesus, then His church, those for whom He died, those who are unified with Him and in Him, the church in which He is building should be filled with men and women who encourage each other with truth, who exhort each other with truth, who worship together in truth, who grow together in truth, who teach truth, who love truth, whose lives are characterized by truth and speaking it to each other. And I think for the most part, most Christians have an easy time encouraging one another with truth. But it gets a bit more difficult when it comes to correction or admonishment. Brothers and sisters, we have to be the truth, the church. We have to be individuals who above all else desire truth. We have to desire to speak it. And we have to desire that it be spoken to us. There are some of you in here who have a hard time speaking truth. And I'm not saying you enjoy lying. But you fear hurting other people's feelings, so you might soften the blow. And maybe only saying half of what someone needs to hear. Then there are some of you who have no problem with this at all. There are some in the church who claim the gift of admonishment and they even have a self-made badge so that they can wear it to church for all to see and for all to fear. Those people are equally dangerous for unity. And Paul gets to this in a few verses. Our speech has to fit the occasion. 
See, the truth spoken has to be done with the hearts of being members of one another. It has to be done with humility and gentleness and kindness, with the other person's best in mind and heart. It has to be done in the context of being members of one another, of building up and maturing in love. It needs to be done nonetheless. The other side of this coin is this. You have to be willing to have truth spoken to you. Do you desire truth to be spoken to you? Or do you like it to be softened a little bit? And this can be tricky. The heart can be deceiving in this. So how do you respond when truth confronts you? Are you encouraged by it? Even though it might hurt? Does it soften you or does it harden you? Does it cause you to be thankful or does it cause you to be resentful? Do you get angry at the messenger? Or does it transform you from the inside out? Does it cause you to remove yourself from the body and the other members? Or does it cause you to press into the body even more? See, the old self reacts to truth by rejecting it. The new self responds and is changed by it, even when it hurts. The truth is essential. And it is necessary for us to know Christ, to love Christ, to worship Him, to proclaim Him, to grow in Him, and to live for Him. And brothers and sisters, because of that, we need to speak it to one another loudly and clearly in encouragement and softly and tenderly but still clearly in admonishment. Don't lie by softening or telling someone what they want to hear. Speak truth and let the Word of God do its work in the heart and life of the listener. This is what is best for the unity and the health and the growth of the body. And this is what makes us look more and more and more like our precious Savior. We find the second exhortation to help us live according to the new self in verses 26 and 27. Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Again, Paul here steals from the Old Testament. This time he quotes Psalm 4, verse 4. Again, I believe you'll notice, although he switches up the order this time, we still have this exhortation in the form of a negative and positive command, and then he follows it with a reason for this exhortation. This time he begins with the positive. He says, be angry. That's right, you heard it correctly. This is a command. But he's saying that the Christian, I'm sorry, Paul's not allowing for an attribute of anger or a conditional uh, or a continual condition of anger. But he is saying that the Christian, it's okay to be angry about some things. Anger in and of itself is not sinful. God expresses anger. We know from the, the gospel that Jesus went into the temple twice and he drove out the, the thieving leaders who were using the temple and the sacrificial system for their worldly gain. They're taking advantage of the poor and using their own rules and regulations to put money in their own pockets. Jesus cursed the fig tree. He was angered time and time again at the relig religious leaders because they were leading people straight to hell by what they were teaching and commanding. We see time and time again God's anger and His judgments. So no, anger is not intrinsically sinful. And there are things that it is okay to be angered by. We should be angered by false teaching and all those who are leading impressionable weak people to damnation. We should be angered at the murder of the unborn, the parading of depra depravity and the deep immorality that is being pushed on us today. 
It's okay to be angry at the lies and, and denial of gender being assigned by the Creator at conception. It's okay to be angry at the attack on the family and male headship. And yes, parents, it is even okay to be angry at your children's sin. And it's okay for them to know that you are angry at sin. As long as you're just as angry at your own sin as you are at theirs. Don't discipline them that anger. But being angry is not sin. But we must always keep in mind that God's anger is never out of control. It is never sinful in His response. And He is always angry at the right time and at the right things. So Paul is telling the Christian that he or she is to be angry. Angry like God. Angry at the right things and at the right time. And for it to be under control. But you and I know all too well that this is very, very, very rarely the case. And so Paul goes right into the second command. Do not sin in that anger. And too often our anger is not at the right things or the right time. So how can we tell if our anger is righteous or not? What, what accompanies your anger? I will ask you this. What accompanies your anger? Or what does your anger produce? See, two times in, in Ezekiel. One in chapter 18, verse 32. And another in chapter 33, verse 11. God, in, in pleading for the repentance of His people, declares, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And then He pleads with them to turn, to repent, and to live. And we know that they don't, and He does judge them. But when we talk about God's anger and wrath, we cannot leave His compassion behind. We can't leave His empathy behind. And even though we know God did judge these people, there's a sense of compassion that He still has for them. And I understand that there's mystery here. But I say all of this to point out that often in our sinful anger, we leave behind the compassion. Even the things that should make us angry, there should be a bit of sadness in it as well. See, the false teacher is teaching a damning gospel, and that should make us angry. But the souls that are being deceived in the teacher's soul will spend eternity somewhere, either in heaven or hell. And that should make us grieve. That should make us compassionate. And we should desire for the patience of God so that He might grant them repentance. We should want God's glory to be seen and held high. And we should be angry when it's not. But there should be some sadness for those who are missing it. So if you're angry as fury without a bit of compassion and sorrow, then it's probably an earthly, selfish anger and not a heavenly god -like. And Paul says, but do not let the sun go down in your anger. This more than likely is to be taken proverbially and not literally. Because there are times in a marital discussion that it can't be resolved before the sun goes down. And it can be midnight. And both of you are tired. You're not thinking straight. Go to bed, get some rest, and talk about it when you aren't tired and when you can think straight. You may not be able to meet for a couple days with someone who has offended you, okay. But do it as soon as you can. And Paul's saying, do not make it a practice to allow your anger then to fester and grow and become embittered and make your heart hard and callous towards someone else. Speak the truth to the one who has sinned and deal with it in love, humility, gentleness, and forbear with them. Work it out and be eager to maintain the unity that is ours as soon as you can. And the reason for this, he says, is that we are not to give the, any opportunity to the devil. I think Paul would tell us that there are really mainly two areas in which Satan attacks the church and the believer. The first area we've talked about is the area of truth. Satan twists and distorts truth. This is how he deceives the unregenerate. 
And if He can sway the Christian to error, then He can then distort the glory of Christ in his or her life in the church. But the second area that Satan attacks is the area of unity. A sinful anger that does not get resolved gives the devil an opportunity to drive a wedge between believers. It gives him a foot in the door to allow unity to be broken. It allows him to isolate the individuals from each other so that reconciliation does not happen. He loves hard hearts. He loves embittered hearts. He loves jealous hearts. He loves unforgiving hearts because those hearts look nothing like God. And they destroy the unity that brings glory to the Godhood. It makes the unity that Christ won on the cross hard to see and recognize in God's people. Brothers and sisters, if there is ever something that we have to continue to work hard at, this is one of those things. If you are angry, if your feelings get hurt, if you see sin in my life or anyone else's life, love Christ, love truth, love unity, love me enough to not grow bitter. If you can't forgive something without talking to that person about it, then talk to them about it and forgive. Conflict is not bad. There are times when it is necessary. We need to do these things that the glory of Christ might be held on to and magnified in our relationships. So the new man, Paul is saying, will be putting off falsehood and putting on lies because this is now who he or she is and because that's what's best for the body. And this new man will be actively putting on righteous anger and not sinning when he or she gets anger because the new man has been created in the likeness of God. And when we do act this way, Satan's schemes and operations are put down and not allowed a foothold in the Christian's life or in the church. You don't see this out in the world. Because all of this, in all of this, the power of the gospel and the glory of Christ are put on display for the whole world to see. So that Christ is made much of. Even your own lives aren't about you. About the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you this morning for your word. May you have your way. May it have its way in our hearts today. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.